what I'd like to do is, of course, first, just to let everybody know that we have been fortunate enough to have a sponsor. And by that, I mean a, a very supportive uh, Christian organisation called Christian Vision Radio. It's a national radio program that's uh, run out of Brisbane. Uh, and I'm fortunate to be able to say that uh, uh, I have a regular slot on a Thursday morning around about 10 o'clock. And we talk about issues of concern to Christians as well. So I'm pleased to say that Vision Christian Radio is our sponsor. And I, and I highly encourage everybody to take a look at their uh, website. And of course, listen to the station as well. Uh, before I introduce both of you, I'd like to just sort of hand over to David DeLima, who normally opens up in prayer and says a few words, and then I'll formally introduce both you, Mike, and Ruth. Thank you, David. Well, thanks, Greg. Uh, it's wonderful to be Zooming with everyone again. And thank you to everyone who is joining this. Let's uh, just pray to God and commit the evening to him. Now, Father, we thank you for the gift of family and for young people. We thank you for the, the spread of the gospel across the generations, and we do pray for the current young people out there in churches and universities, colleges, schools, wherever they might be. They're facing many challenges in this hostile and secular culture. So we do pray for Family Voice, and we pray for Mike and Ruth in their respective ministries, that together we may be able to encourage those participating tonight to really get behind our young people. We thank you that your Holy Spirit gives dreams and visions to young and old. And we thank you that you love your message of truth and wisdom to be shared across the generations. And Lord, we got to confess that so many of these problems facing our young people have happened under our watch. And we're not leaving the, the world to the next generation in a better condition that we found it in. So Lord, help us, we pray, to turn away from our own errors and wrongdoings and help us to really understand your Holy Spirit's leading so that we may serve you authentically as salt and light. So we commit to you, the young people, the young Christian people of Australia, and pray that tonight we'll make a, a small step forward in helping to encourage them as your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, David. And um, what I'll do now is I'll introduce both Ruth and Mike, but what I'd like to do is just to let you know that uh, for those that have registered for tonight where we'll be having a, a brief talk from uh, Ruth and then Mike, and then we'll go into an open, uh, open Q&A type session. May I introduce Dr. Ruth Lou Cabio, is that right? Or well, close enough, is it? That's it, well done. <laughs> close enough. Uh, Dr. Ruth uh, Lou Cabio is the Dean of Women at YouthWorks College. And um, You've been in training of, and children ministries for over 15 years. And I believe you're studying to do a, um, a fellowship at the Anglican Deaconess Ministries, where you're going to write a history uh, youth, uh, of, of youth ministry in Australia, which I think will be absolutely fascinating to see the results when they come out. Of course, Ruth, you're married to Alan, who's an Anglican minister at uh, St. St. James Croydon. You have three young adult children. You love reading, history, novels and bushwalking in the Blue Mountains. How, how wonderful is that? The Blue Mountains is a wonderful part of the, uh, of the Sydney uh, regional area. So Ruth, if I may call you that, or if you prefer doctor or reverend, I think you're a reverend as well, but Ruth, over to you and let's talk about the issues that youth are, youth are facing today. At, uh, and I'm talking here, if I may, 18 to 35 year olds, but there is no there's no uh, reason why you can't talk younger or older. So over to you, Ruth. Thanks, Greg. And yes, please call me Ruth, not um, not Dr. Ruth or anything like that. Yeah, Ruth. I'm just going to share my screen if that's okay. So if you don't mind. Uh, I'll do that now. That there you go. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much for having me speak tonight. I'm going to be talking about the challenges of Christian youth in secular Australia. And Mike will be then speaking about how, uh, how to talk about these issues with young people and parents and churches and how they can respond. So uh, how is secular Australia shaping our young people? 
I thought I'd start by telling you about our first year theology class. Uh, we actually have the former Archbishop Peter Jensen um, teach our theology class. And this year he asked all the students to write a paragraph describing what was going on in the soul of young Australians. And the, the paragraphs that the students wrote were absolutely fascinating. I wanted to share them with you. Um, so what's their answers, because they're the ones that are relating to and very close to the young people um, in our churches. So what's happening in the soul of young Australians? They said uh, that some of the students identified the influence of identity politics, which focuses on rights for oppressed groups. So pro-choice, pro-LGBT, using correct pronouns, cancel culture, freedom, Black Lives Matter. They mentioned that uh, young people really feel passionate about these social issues. Uh, they, another one mentioned that this is shaped by expressive individualism, that every person has the right to express their identity. Um, another one said, working on yourself as a top priority, cutting someone out of your life if they don't give off the kind of energy or friendship that you want. Another one said, freedom. That's in the soul of the young Australian. They want to be free. Some of the students mentioned the incredible privilege of many young Australians. And along with this privilege, of course, is busyness, ambitious striving, and many um, suffering from mental health issues. Uh, I thought this was a great uh, quote to finish with in conclusion. Someone wrote that Gen Z live in an incredibly turbulent world. They're continually losing identity markers and moral markers and are on an uneven footing. Everything changes so quickly all the time. I think on top of those, um, nobody's mentioned, but I think I would add uh, the, the problem of porn, um, great confusion about the development of their sexuality and the issue of gender fluidity, uh, big issues for young people. And of course, um, consent and dealing with sexual issues um, has been a huge thing for young Australians at the moment. So I wanted to challenge you, uh, what do you think is the biggest problem for young people? Give you a little time to think about that. We've got lots of options there, lots of things that they're facing. What's the biggest problem? Well, I think in one sense, um, Christians face the same problems of every young person, of every adolescent. They're trying to grow up in a world that's changing around them. And I wanted to look at the problems that young people face through the lens of a man called, a psychologist called Stanley Hall. He talks about the three problems of adolescence. So the first problem, who am I? A young person has to work out who they are, their identity. They have to work out with whom do I belong? So their affinity. And then finally, what should I do with my life? their sense of agency. These are the, th the three big questions that young people have to wrestle with as they grow up. Uh, so firstly, who am I? There's been a bit of a change in our culture that traditionally the, the understanding of who you are, your identity was determined outside yourself. Uh, identity was given to you, um, given to you by being a created person, being made in God's image and being someone who's able to work, to act with great goodness, but also we know um, from Christian understanding, terrible selfishness. Christians too have always said that our identity is shaped by our relationship with the Lord, that Christians are known and loved by God and are a child of God, part of his family. So he's, we're defined by something outside ourselves, by the God who made us. And sexuality is not to be is to be confined to the one flesh relationship of marriage. This is a traditional understanding of sexuality that's part of our identity. Then a big change has happened in our society. Um, a secular view of the self is that you don't look outside yourself. You actually look inside yourself. That identity is self created. Um, peoples are, people are individuals that are part of the natural world and are basically good, but of course the social structure or system um, 
we live in, a secular view would argue that that's where the evil comes from. And also sexuality is fundamental, they would argue, to our identity and happiness. It must be discovered and expressed. It's fundamental to being happy to express your sexuality. Um, so where does this come from? Uh, um, there's a significant Christian philosopher called uh, Charles Taylor, who wrote The Secular Age, and he speaks about expressive individualism. And I find this uh, philosophical idea really helpful. So I just read this quote. It says, the understanding of life, which emerges with the romantic expression of the late 18th century, and of course still influences us today, that each of us has his, her own way of realizing our humanity and that it is important to find and live out one's own as against surrendering to conformity with a model imposed on us from outside by society or the previous generation or religious or political authority. So expressive individualism, I think we're uh, used to the idea of our culture being individualistic. Um, and here, Charles Taylor builds upon that uh, believing that the secular age will teach that, yes, we're all individuals uh, and we need to make choices, individual choices, to work to realise our humanity, to live out, to, to choose who that true self will be. You find this true self by looking within to your own feelings and intuitions. And in fact, uh, Taylor's saying society and institutions will actually try to make you conform They'll repress you uh, and you might need to fight against them to, to discover your true self. And it's not just about finding your true self, but then expressing your true self. Uh, it's expressive individualism. You need to access, express who you are to live an authentic life. So you might have heard sayings like, you know, you be you, that young people say quite often, or be who you are, or be authentic. These express an expressive individualism. And in fact, the internet is full of kind of like secular conversion stories, uh, kind of I was lost, but now I'm found. Uh, narratives of finding oneself, especially in the area of sexuality. I wanted to give you an example of that, that really kind of touched me actually. It was the story of Elliot Page. Um, you might've heard about Elliot Page, uh, it's the story of a young actor who has recently come out as trans. Um, he, he wrote this uh, Twitter story talking about his, his coming out and being true to his, what he says, authentic self. So if you read at the beginning, hi friends, I want to share with you that I'm trans. My pronouns are he, they, and my name is Elliot. I feel lucky to be writing this, to be here, to have arrived at this place in my life. I feel overwhelming gratitude for the incredible people who have supported me along this journey. I can't begin to express how remarkable it makes me, it feels to finally love who I am enough to pursue my authentic self. It's an interesting kind of language, isn't it? The authentic self. Um, and then if you skip down to the last paragraph, I love that I am trans and I love that I am queer and the more I hold myself close and fully embrace who I am, the more I dream, the more my heart grows and the more I thrive. So I wanted you to notice with me this, uh, this search for the authentic self, the expressive um, individualism that's part of our secular culture and the kind of, uh, I guess, conversion stories of people that are searching for their true self and searching to express it. So this is one way that um, young people have struggled with the question of who am I? The next question is, with whom do I belong? And in our culture, influenced by Christian values, um, in the past, we would have said, well, with whom do you belong? You belong to God's family. You belong to your own family. You belong to our community. Uh, we would even say as Christians, there's no privileged gender or race. From Galatians 3.28, we're one in Christ. Our secular culture is quite different. It really emphasises different tribes, different kinds of groups of people, um, that there's people who have a lot of privilege and power. 
And there's other people who are very vulnerable and are oppressed. So our secular culture says that uh, Christians and churches and often families have been oppressors. And it's kind of a dangerous kind of world where you need to uh, gather in your group and express who you are as a tribe to sort of protect each other and uh, help each other to do that. And, and in fact, it is true that um, part of this secular uh, narrative has come about because the church has at times uh, been abusive with its use of power and we have terrible stories about uh, child abuse that have come out in the last 20 years. Um, there's times where church leaders have um, abused the power that they had. And um, the family too has been a contested place. You know, we've had lots of stories about domestic violence at the moment where young people have not been safe at home and where children have been um, the, 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 the institutions that were meant to protect them haven't been protecting them. So church and family are often seen as the oppressor, the bad guy. Um, it's difficult, I think, for in churches for young Christians who are in minorities or uh, are not male because they, it's harder for them to feel like they belong. Um, in our secular culture, it's very important for young people to feel like somebody represents them, part of their tribe is there. Um, just to share an, exp uh, an experience I had lately, I was um, talking to a younger Christian woman. We were both reading the same book and really enjoying it. But then she got really upset with this particular book. And she said, uh, it's because all the stories, all the examples in the book were about men, not women. And she's a woman. And she said to me, I felt invisible. And it was fascinating because I didn't feel invisible, um, but she she felt in terms of her worldview, she wanted to be represented in what she read, in what she thought about. She wanted to see stories of herself. Um, she was looking for this sense of where's my tribe? Do I belong? Am I represented? So young Christians are influenced by this secular culture around them and this question of with whom do I belong? And then finally, the last question, what should I do? The traditional Christian answer to that, of course, is to love God and to love your neighbour, to build God's kingdom and to serve God's people, to share your faith with others. But in our secular culture, the answer to that question is to create your own meaning by looking within yourself, because that's how you'll find happiness. Um, it's a self-created uh, purpose in life if you like. And I thought about how that's actually expressed by different young people that I know of. I was thinking of, uh, first of all, all the speaking out for the vulnerable to seek a more just society. And I was thinking again of uh, that story of Elliot Page. Um, so I'll take you back to that um, story that I told you about. You'll see Elliot Page's desire for a more just world, he talks about. So uh, in the second paragraph, he says, I've been endlessly inspired by so many in the trans community. Thank you for your courage, your generosity, and ceaselessly working to make this world a more inclusive and compassionate place. I will offer whatever support I can and continue to strive for a more loving and equal society. Elliot Page really feels like they ha um, he has a very purpose, a, a real purpose in their life to, uh, to make a more just society. It's a very, um, a lot of young people are very exercised about social issues we're seeing at the beginning. And this is one way that they express that. I also see in my experience of young people that there are plenty of young people in my youth group that just wanna get ahead. Uh, they go to private schools, they work extremely hard. They have parents that really pressure them they don't really think much about um, looking out for the vulnerable or a more just society. They just uh, put their heads down and they work really hard and they want a good job and they think this is the way to happiness and the way to money, actually. Um, finally, I thought, you know, there's other young people that believe, how, what should I do? Well, the way to find a meaningful life is just to be happy, to do what feels good. 
and uh, we have a big problem with um, sexual assault at the moment. This comes from this sort of um, uh, sense of, in, you know, sense of what my life is about. It's just about uh, pleasure, to do what I think feel, feels good, just be happy. Problems with alcohol and drugs comes from this same sort of uh, intention to, to find happiness, to do what feels good. And not thinking about the consequences of your actions. So adolescence, working through these three questions of who am I, uh, with whom do I belong and what should I do? Adolescence, growing up can be really, really hard. And young Christians are working on these questions in the midst of a secular culture that's giving them really different answers from the traditional Christian answers. So I was wondering, how are they going? Um, how is it affecting them? And I, I read this report by Mission Australia. Uh, this is the last thing I'll say in conclusion. Uh, they did a survey last year of 15 to 19 year olds in Australia. And the top three issues of concern for them were coping with stress, mental health, body image. Um, huge problems with mental health with young people. Uh, huge amounts of stress, especially with education and other stresses in their life. Huge sense of um, concern about what they look like and who they are. They're under extreme pressure and looking for answers and looking for direction. So how are we going to help them? What are we going to do? I'll hand it over to Mike to give us all the answers. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much, um, Ruth. That's excellent presentation and we'll come back to you very shortly. May I just quickly introduce um, Reverend Mike Dicker, Dean of Students at Youth Works College. Um, <clears throat> if I may, I think, Mike, it seems you've come from a, you were a tradesman at one time. And uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, the problem I've got is I can never find a tradie when I want one, but that, that's another story. Um, <laughs> Mike is um, Mike uh, was, a, was a children's minister at All Saints at Petersham here in uh, Sydney in the western suburbs. Um, mm. And he loves his wife, he loves Jesus, he has three children, he, he loves um, visual art, motorbikes, hardware, music, and unfortunately, AFL. But that's all right, we still love you, Mike. <laughs> Over to you on your perspective on how youth are coping in a secular society, Mike. Yeah, thanks very much, Greg. I'll, uh, I'll share my screen now as well. Just to bring up some slides. Okay, can everyone see that? Yeah. Uh, great, wonderful. Uh, well, I... I uh, um, as I was thinking about uh, Secular Australia, was thinking also about uh, this book by um, Kevin Van Hooser, which is uh, called Everyday Theology. And it's a, it's a, a text that really talks about how to read the, the current culture and how we might think about the culture we live in and examine it, do cultural exegesis. Uh, but the bit that really kind of stuck out in my mind was in part of the introduction to that book, uh, Kevin says, that for the first time, church has had to mount a mission to a culture that was previously Christian. And that uh, that was really quite a profound statement because when you think about it, you know, Paul was doing mission to a, a pagan world that never heard the kind of ideas that Jesus uh, was espousing, that never really kind of heard the ideas of the gospel uh, in the way that Jesus had put them. Uh, but now we live in a world where people not only have heard those ideas but they've actually assumed those ideas as their own or as kind of common morality uh, and actually then found them disconnected from the Lord Jesus himself and so the big question then that comes about with thinking about how do we minister to young people and children in our contemporary secular society is how do you evangelize cultures that have already received the gospel tacitly assumed its values as their own or openly revised uh, or rejected it and, uh, and I think that's really the big challenge that's kind of set before us that makes it slightly different to the challenges that have faced um, cultures in the past. But I do um, want to, if I can move to the next slide, want to uh, just propose, propose uh, four different ways forward that we might think about 
uh, equipping young people, uh, evangelizing young people and, uh, and helping them to grow in their faith. And the first one is hope, giving them a joyful confidence. The second one is calm, helping them to be a, a non-anxious presence in the world, um, that we might have openness towards them as they explore their identity and faith, uh, rather than giving them fundamentalism, and that we might equip them to critique the world that they live in as well. So let me take you through some of those. Um, th this first one, really, I want to kind of draw our attention to the letter of 1 Peter, and especially chapter 1 in the first six verses, because I think you'll find that there's a lot of resonances with the world of Peter's day and also the secular world that we live in at the moment. Uh, there he describes Christians as uh, exiles in the world who have been scattered throughout the different kind of provinces and lands and yet even though they're exiles they are chosen by God and very special to him to the father um, and that they have been given a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead that this faith which they have in the Lord Jesus Christ that has actually reshaped everything about who they are um, is shielded by God and his great power and that gives them an inexpressible joyfulness so that even as they endure hardship in verse 6 and the, the confiscation of their property, um, they can still greatly rejoice even in the middle of trials. And I wonder if that kind of resonates with our experience perhaps of even being Christians in this day and age where you might feel like you're becoming the minority, where you might feel like the world is against you, and yet you can still have a great joyfulness because your faith in Christ has rebirthed your identity and who you are, and that faith is shielded by God himself. Um, it's interesting, I think, here how Peter really ties the idea of this living hope to our identity, that we have actually been reborn, that everything about us has been made new. And as Ruth just mentioned, one of the big things about our contemporary society is this idea of the authentic self, about being authentic to your true self, but of course, that's complicated because you then have to kind of locate where the authentic self is. Um, there might be a bunch of different ways you might go about doing that. Uh, so if you were to ask somebody, you know, what is your identity and who are you? They might give you a range of different responses that might be about who they are. Uh, in relation to their friends, it could be their gender, it might be their possessions, uh, it might be their social status, the opinions people hold about them. They might define themselves by their body or their work, their values, beliefs, family, ethnicity, personality, where they live, you know, whether you're from, uh, you know, the eastern suburbs, from Sydney, from South Australia, or perhaps whether you follow AFL or rugby league. Um, there's a whole range of different things you might use to uh, describe yourself and your identity. And of course, the, the Bible kind of says that all those things uh, have their goodness and all of those things are able to be corrupted as well. And usually those things become corrupted when they take primacy, where they become the one controlling thing that defines who you are. So as Ruth has said, perhaps sexuality might be the common uh, dominating value at the moment that really defines who people are those those desires um, those very strong sexual desires that human beings have always had to wrestle with but of course the gospel has something really quite different and it says that our one controlling identity marker really is to be the cross um, and so uh, in the gospels of Matthew Mark and Luke Jesus has this quite profound thing to say in the center of each of those those synoptic gospels. Uh, and the truth that Jesus kind of gives to us is that as we deny ourselves and give up ourself, that's where we actually find ourselves, our authentic self. And so Jesus says, for whosoever will save their soul actually will lose it, but whosoever shall lose their soul for my sake and for the gospels, well, the same shall save it. You know, what shall it profit a person if they shall gain the whole world and lose their own soul? Or what shall a person give in exchange for their soul? Um, and so there, again, is where we can locate our authentic self. Uh, you certainly are a sexual being. You certainly do have a gender. You do have gifts and skills or work. You have tastes and you have styles and all those different things. But Jesus says, actually, all those things are to come in service to him and to the cross, that in denying ourselves, we will find our authentic self in him.
So there's the first thing uh, that we would have a hope uh, of our authentic self, our living birth, as we uh, give ourselves over to Jesus. But the second thing that Peter wants to say in his letter in uh, chapter 3, verses 13, is that because of that uh, self, that new authentic self we find in Christ, that we should also have a real sense of calm in this day and age. There's something really quite profound here that he says in chapter 3, verse 13. Uh, he says to the Christians that he's writing to, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? And that is a real kind of common sense principle, that if you're someone who's out to be a good citizen, to do well for others, then why would anyone harm you? But of course, the experience is that uh, even then you are harmed. The Lord Jesus himself was sent to the cross, even though he was eager to do good. And so Peter writes, verse 14, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. And then he says, do not fear what they fear and do not be frightened. Instead, in your hearts, fear Christ as Lord. And, and that also, again, is a really profound thing for Peter to say because what he says there is that we are to realign our fears, not fear what the rest of society fears. Um, they fear climate change. They fear what's going to happen to their kids. Uh, certainly they fear death in all its different kind of forms. Um, but here, Christians who find their authentic self and their hope in Christ are not to have those fears. Instead, our fear is in the Lord Jesus, uh, a relational fear, a fear of trust, if you will. And that, of course, enables us to be calm in the face of everyone else's fears and be able to give gracious answers. So verse 15, Peter continues, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander, for it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And here is really something quite profound, that as young people in our world locate their authentic self in Christ and denying their selves and their desires and their, their wants to kind of shape themselves after their own image, as they find their rock-solid hope and self in the Lord Jesus, they don't have to fear what the rest of the world fears. They put their trust in Jesus. And that will stand out in the world in a way that makes people kind of ask, well, why aren't you so worried about the way the world is going like I'm worried about the way the world is going? Why don't you fear the opinions of others the way that I fear the opinions of others? And when they ask you that, you get to give an answer for the hope that you have. And I really think that here is something we need to focus on for our young people is that as they find their hope in the Lord Jesus, their authentic self there, but they also find their confidence there, a confidence which allows them to not participate in the, uh, the anxiety and also the alarmism of our world as well. So there's a good question to ask. Where is the confidence that our young people uh, are having or where are they finding it and how are we helping them to find it? Uh, the third thing is uh, openness. And here I want to kind of take us to the, um, the book of Galatians because there really is another fascinating thing that Paul says here. Uh, that uh, we perhaps often think in moralistic terms about young people and, you know, they, they don't behave like, you know, I did back in my day, what's happened to the morals of young people in this day and age. Um, but Paul actually kind of points us to the fact that rules really don't change the heart. Uh, in fact, you know, the laws of God, which have been very good um, for God's people, have actually never shaped the heart of God's people. In fact, they've just exposed our sinfulness and our failure to keep them. And so he says to you who are trying to be justified by the law, you've alienated yourself from Christ, you've fallen away from grace. And actually, that's where we find the change is in grace not in law keeping. And so our job is then to teach love and not rules. Uh, Paul says, uh, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And then further down, he says in verses 13 and 14, he says, uh, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another Humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in this one command, love your neighbour as yourself. And again, we're not trying to correct the morals of young people through rules or fundamentalism, which kind of says, don't ask questions, just believe this. No, we want them to love, but also to understand the complexity of love and what that looks like, uh, as Paul kind of goes on to say. Uh, in the end, 
That's the struggle of living for Christ. It's the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. That's the big battle. And trying to teach young people to know how to love in all the different complex ways is the hard task that we're faced with today, even as Christians have been faced with throughout the centuries. And here's where we want people, young people especially, to be wrestlers with their faith. We don't want them just to assent to things that they haven't thought through or wrestled with. In fact, we want to teach them how to wrestle with the scriptures, with their experience, and continue doing so for the rest of their lives. Um, so here is a, uh, a little bit of an, a developmental kind of uh, identity thing that was um, put together by James Marcia, where he talks about some of the, the different ways that uh, young people perhaps reach identity or miss out on kind of having a solid identity. Um, you can probably see up in the, the top left-hand box there, that's the uh, identity formation achieved where someone has had opportunity to explore their identity and has committed to something. But then down the bottom, the moratorium, someone who's had an exploration of their identity but really hasn't landed anywhere yet, up in the top right, a person who forecloses on their identity is someone who has a commitment to something but really hasn't uh, had any exploration. So this might be someone who just really follows the rules of their parents but has never tested them. And then you have identity diffused, which is those people that have not explored uh, nor have they committed to anything. They just kind of um, move about and change depending on their environment. Um, here might be some uh, other ways that you could kind of conceive of those categories that those that achieve identity formation in Christ know how to wrestle with the world, their experiences, their desires, but also the truth of the gospel. Um, those who are, that are still exploring but never landing anywhere, they're a bit like the travellers always looking to find themselves. Um, those that are just kind of following rules but not exploring, they're more like your, your Draco Malfoys for all you Harry Potter fans out there, just following their parents, doing what they're told, but actually have never owned it for themselves and then those that have a diffused identity formation well they're like the chameleon and they're almost schizophrenic really in their personality and their identity because they're they have as many identities as there are groups of people that they are involved with and, and our big task for young people in this day and age like it always has been is really just to be open to them to give them the opportunity to explore and arrive at a commitment so they can wrestle with the world, the gospel and their experiences and achieve a good and robust identity formation in Christ. So as the third, here's the fourth thing, is that I think we need to teach uh, young people in secular Australia to be able to critique the world that they're in. Uh, in Colossians, we have uh, Paul writing uh, to the church there in Colossae, and he talks to them again about kind of following rules and so on. But he says, you have died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of the world. Why as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? You know, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have nothing, uh, uh, which have to do with the things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining essential indulgence. Uh, again, you know, these kind of rules that we might like to give young people to, to fit into might have an appearance of wisdom. Uh, don't do this, don't touch that, don't sleep with that person, behave this way, make sure you, you dot your I's and cross your T's. And they have an appearance of wisdom. Maybe we feel like we're making progress, but actually those things, those rules never are able to restrain sensual indulgence in a world where sexuality and identity are such big pressures and is are so available to people. And I think what we need to do is whenever we're tempted to kind of just give rules and whenever young people are, are tempted just to go for black and white rules themselves, uh, we actually need to teach them how to exegete their culture and themselves. Um, they should know how to read the scriptures, but also know how to read their world. So like a stone fruit, like that uh, peach that I've got there on the screen, uh, they might know the right bits to eat and accept, but also the bit to kind of spit out of their mouth and, and throw away. Uh, I think really the big question we want to teach young people and maybe even teach ourselves as we think about the world we live in is does the world we live in deliver on all the different promises of life? That it, uh, that it hands out to us daily, not just through advertising, but just through the, the water we swim in. We feel like life might be found in uh, working harder. Life might be found in winning the respect of a certain person we like. Life might be found in all manner of different ways. But the question we have to keep asking is, does it deliver? 
even if it looks attractive, we want to ask if it delivers on it. Um, here is the stat I think that really brings this home for us. Uh, and that is the stat about death in Australia that comes from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Here's a little um, uh, a chart that they have drawn up, uh, drawn up. This is from 2016. There's a more recent one out as well. And uh, one of the most shocking things I think you'll see on this chart is that for men and women between the ages of 15 and 44, suicide is the biggest killer. Now, if the world we live in is uh, not only just safe but prosperous, if we are really progressing and evolving in this world, then why are we more likely to die by our own hand than by accidents or even by cancer or coronary heart disease? I think this is the stat that really points to the fact that there is something desperately wrong with the world that we live in. Uh, the world that we live in has the appearance of life. It promises a lot about life. And yet this stat shows us that many people are still not satisfied and are still ending their own life. Uh, something is wrong. Um, and so this is the number one fact that no one can ignore. And that is that life is fickle for each and every one of us. And death has a 100% strike weight strike rate and so whatever the solution we think for young people is we have to ask whether or not that solves our death problem uh, whether or not it actually does deliver on the promise of life and, and here's where I want to say that the gospel is not just true but it is good and I think in the uh, in the world that is so attached to feelings and emotion uh, to the affections of our soul if you like we, not, we need to not just kind of prove that Jesus was real and that he said the things he said and did the things he did. Sure, it is true. But we also have to demonstrate that it is good, that it is livable and that it actually explains the world we live in. And here's where, you know, I've borrowed the... Uh, the um, industry super symbol here, we, you know, you compare the pair, if you remember those ads, here's where we need to really bring under the spotlight the comparison of what the gospel holds out, as well as what life is holding out. And if the gospel is true, then every other promise of life must indeed be a lie. And so it's worth us kind of just probing that and exploring that and letting our young people explore that so they can find that out for themselves and again, put their hope and confidence in the gospel. So here's some big explanatory questions to ask about the gospel. I think that we want to ask ourselves and help our young people to ask as well. Um, we want our young people to ask, how does the gospel make sense of my experience? I mean, how does Jesus make sense of death and suffering? Like, why do I suffer? Uh, why is there still death? Why is that a feature of the world that we live in? We then want to ask of the gospel, does it present a beautiful and good view of life? Not just a true view, but is it actually good? Does it hold out a vision of life that appeals to me? Uh, does it offer life or really is the gospel just offering slavery and coercion, um, you know, as Karl Marx would say? Or does it offer fear or does it offer a certain hope? Does it offer a confidence that allows our people to be the non-anxious presence in the room? And lastly, what is good? Um, uh, what is the good news about this gospel? You know, uh, how is it attractive? How does it offer a better alternative than everything else they get in this world? I think these are key questions that we want to be asking our young people as they live in the luxury and, um, uh, you know, prosperity of the world that we currently experience in 21st century Australia. So uh, there are just four different ways forward to think about um, hope, can we give our young people a joyful confidence in their authentic self found in Christ? Uh, can we help them be calm in the face of uh, the attacks and trials that they face because of that hope and joyful confidence? And can we be open towards them rather than laying down strict rules? Can we be open and allow them to explore and arrive at a commitment to, to Jesus? If it is the best and most viable option for life or the only option for life in this world, then surely the gospel can defend itself. How do we help them do that? And lastly, how can we equip our young people to critique the world that they're in, to know the scriptures, know themselves, know the world and, uh, and see where the lies are as well as the, uh, the truth of the gospel. Uh, so there are some ways forward, I think that will be helpful for us. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Um, riveting data there and, um, 
I really appreciate you sharing it. Now, both John and David are going to ask some questions, but I just want to ask one quick one while we're waiting for them to get the questions ready. Uh, Mike and Ruth, my wife's a school teacher in a girls' school, and she came back with some survey results, and here are the top five concerns of children, you know, youth. And you'll probably agree with some of this, or maybe the, not the order, but certainly the topic. Number one, depression. Mm. Number two, bullying. Number three, sexuality. Number four, drug use. And number five, alcohol. It's interesting mm. because when I was growing up, alcohol was on top of the list, but that's moved down. My question to you quickly, you as people that are involved with youth, are you finding that the youth are prepared to share their faith in the public arena, given we've got a woke and cancel culture that will get them bullied straight away if they come out, so to speak. Either Ruth or Mike. Yeah, look, I think actually there are a lot of people that uh, young people that are willing to um, speak up for Jesus and for their faith. But I do think, I mean, obviously they're finding it increasingly harder to do as uh, as I, I assume it adults are experiencing mm. as well. I, I think in the end, it's often about young people wondering whether or not they, what they believe is just and true and good. So when the rest of the world is telling you that uh, you're a bigot and that what you believe is harmful to people, um, then it's, it's, uh, it's not hard to be persuaded that that's the case when that's the overwhelming message that you hear. But again, you know, teaching young people to actually see the truth of the gospel and perhaps the false promises of those other things really helps give them the confidence to say, uh, look, I don't have all the answers. I'm not the most persuasive arguer, but I'm, I'm sticking with Jesus because uh, even if you think the way you live is the best, it doesn't give me life from the dead. You know what I mean? There, there is no other life, um, uh, life to be found in no other name except in Jesus Christ. Amen. And we just have to keep building their confidence in that as well. Thank you. Um, John, do you have a question? I do, um, maybe from Mike. Uh, in his presentation, um, in your presentation, Mike, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, this is the first time, I guess, that a previously Christian culture is needing to be, I guess, re-evangelised. Um, and why do you think, like, sort of historically that's that's become the case? Uh, like, what, do, you, do you have any thoughts on the, the reasons we are where we are now and, 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 and what needs to be reversed in, say, how children and, and young people have been taught by the church and by their families that needs to be changed so that we can reverse the current sort of difficult situation uh, that our culture's in. Yeah, look, to be honest, I don't think it, it can be reversed. I think the, um, the, the veins of Christianity and the values of the Gospels run so deep that uh, we assume them now without question. And so... Uh, you know, 2,000 years or maybe it's more like 1,500 years of a Western Christianized world has really drilled that into our DNA. And I don't think you can really go back from here. I think what you have to do is actually ask whether or not, um, let's say, atheism uh, can hold to the values that Christ gives. Because when you really, uh, when the push comes to shove, um, atheism has no um, reason for believing in the innate value of human life apart from its resourcefulness and utility. So it's worth asking those kind of questions to say, you know, why do you think that uh, human life, all humans are valuable or that all human right, uh, human beings have the right to express themselves or the right to do this? Because uh, what's that founded on, you know? Because um, I think they'll work out in the end, actually, it's founded on a, a, Christian, a Christian presupposition about human value. Um, uh, and so people like Peter Singer are actually really helpful with this because he's an atheist that puts his money where his mouth is. And, uh, and he's actually willing to do the hard work. Although it turns out actually for Peter Singer, you know, people have value if they make you happy and therefore it's just another diff a different type of emotivism. Uh, but I think, you know, pressing people on those is, is trying to help them commit to what they actually believe or seeing that through. Um, but I don't think there's any way back from here and unless it's really for society to become completely depraved and completely detached from its Christian heritage so that it becomes pagan again like it was in the first century and then it would hear the gospel afresh but uh, you know the gospels I think far too pervasive in the world for that to be the case. Um, Ruth might have a, a better historical answer for how we got here as a church historian. 
Uh, in, well, I have been reading this book um, by Carl Truman. So some people might have, well, Mike's been reading as well, you know. Um, it's called The Making of the Modern Self. Mm. Is that right? That's all it's called. Mm. Yeah, making the, the rise self. and triumph of the, the rise and triumph of the modern self, uh, and it is like this big history of West, Western civilization uh, from a Christian perspective. It starts off with the question, uh, you know, the Carl Truman's grandfather, he would never have understood the question um, if he was if 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 a person said to him, "I feel like I'm a man trapped in a woman's body." That will make absolutely no sense to his grandfather. It'd be non a nonsensical statement, and yet, it, uh, in our culture, in our secular culture today, that's quite a uh, coherent thing to say. People will understand what you mean and will be empathetic. And um, Carl Truman was helpful to me because he explained. You know, lots of us will say, "Well, the problem has happened in the sexual revolution in the '60s." That's when we went from being like a Christian society to being a secular culture. And, uh, you know, throughout Christian sexuality and brought in all these terrible um, different understandings of the self. But uh, Carl Truman argues, well, actually the seeds of it are way back in the 18th century and talks a lot about expressive individualism as well. Uh, that intellectuals back then, uh, people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, sowed these seeds of, of uh, I guess this is the same time, you know, Mike was talking about the Christian roots of our civilization. At the same time, we've also had the roots in our civilization of atheism um, growing in the, in the same soil. And so, yeah, it's interesting to see how those two uh, interact with each other and the fruition of our uh, sort of philosophical thought which is filtered down through the universities and schools and are really influencing us today um, particularly from you know the the left and from this more um this different understanding of expressive individualism thank you david yes thank you greg uh, question for ruth what is the world going to look like in 20 years time <laughs> and what new challenges will young christian people face Wow. Um, historians aren't allowed to be prophets. So I have no idea. <laughs> um, what's the world going to be like? Uh, you know, I think Mike hinted at this, that it, it may be that the kind of decisions we make actually lead to more suicide and more mental health issues and people realise there's something bad going on here. And they may be more open to the gospel, but, you know, in God's goodness, mm. pray that will happen. Mm. Um, or it, it may be that people become more hardened and there's more persecution. Uh, we, I, I think we just don't know. Mm. Yeah, what was the second half of the question, David? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, well, what new, what new challenges will young Christian people face? What new challenges? I think the, the challenge is the same as it has been uh, to keep living for Jesus, as, as Mike was saying, to um, be hopeful and calm and open and critique the culture. Um, mm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I've got a question for Mike as well. Mike, are you saying that churches traditionally have applied a controlling approach to families or sharing, sharing the faith in a controlling manner that's now being challenged by all the options of the modern world and therefore is that why children are turning away from that controlling model and turning away from the faith? Uh, no, I don't think that's right. Like, I, I certainly think the the church of the Middle Ages before the Reformation was one of um, you just tacitly tacitly accepted what the church said and you didn't question it. You um, you took it on good authority from those that you trusted or those in positions of power. 
and uh, and so you were Christian in that way. Um, but of course, in the Reformation, that really challenged all of that to say, especially the Anabaptists and the Puritans, you know, are you really Christian just because you were baptized as a baby in Anglican church and or a mm. Catholic church and grew up in Christendom? Does that make you a Christian? And they said, no, actually, we, we want to see some kind of fruit of the mm. spirit. We want to see some wrestling with your faith. We want to see some commitment to the scriptures. And I think it's out of out of that world that we we find ourselves where we are today. And I think there might be a little bit of nostalgia for from some but perhaps maybe not articulated this way to get back to that kind of pre-reformation world where you just said this is the way it is and everyone believes it but of course that was never really a uh, um, a good model of authentic faith or commitment that was certainly it was nominal there was nominalism and there was definitely authentic faith there but uh, you know in the, the post-reformation world uh, we, we want to see a fruit on the trees of those that claim to be Christians commitment to the scriptures um, and in order for that to happen we can't go with a fundamentalist mindset that says uh, believe a b c and d don't ask questions uh, and of course, um, young people, and like all people really, should be constantly asking questions. And I'm still confronted by things that I that I read in the scriptures and they challenge my assumptions and they challenge what I hold dear. And in those moments, I, I don't say to myself, Mike, stop thinking and just believe. I say, well, no, why is this the case? And uh, when I notice my doubts, I let the gospel argue against them to overcome them. Mm. And that's what we need to do for our young people as well, as much as we need to do for adults in our church. But of course, the lazy way forward and the easy way forward is just to say, I don't know why, just believe it. But that never really convinces anybody. Good. John, a quick question for you. Yeah, uh, I guess practically, how would uh, best, uh, Mike and Ruth, would you uh, uh, suggest that parents, you know, of younger children today, raising their children should be... Uh, you know, teaching their children, the mothers and fathers, teaching their children to inculcate against, I guess, the, the false worldviews and, and narratives that are out there. Um, how should they be teaching the Christian faith to their young children? Um, I guess I'm thinking maybe resources, I'm thinking methods, I'm thinking, I'm thinking more broadly, you know, like you said about the, the way you, you approach uh, the Christian faith, the openness versus just believe it because I tell you it. Um, mm -hmm. So that, I mean, because many, many, I, I mean, like, for example, you know, there was a time in which the Bible was taught as just antiquated Bible stories, you know, that weren't grounded well in history. And 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 uh, and, and and when another more compelling worldview or philosophy comes along uh, in in say high school or university, children just easily and quickly, the stats have shown, leave the leave the faith uh, that they the parents thought that they professed. So, um, yeah, what advice would you give to parents of children um, today? I mean, firstly, I want to say as a parent myself that it's uh, it's always. The, e the easiest group of people on the planet to guilt are parents because you uh, you recognize the, how even the smallest mistakes of your parenting might have you know drastic consequences uh, so i firstly want to say you know but for the grace of god um you know you might do all the right things and lead a child in the way he should go but uh they they, they go off like a prodigal and uh go find their own way and we pray that they find their way back um, but having given that kind of little caveat and disclaimer, I think, you know, firstly, believing the gospel yourself, um, having those conversations with your, your young people and letting them kind of ask questions. And when you don't know, saying, actually, I don't know, and let's work this out together and discover it together. Um, showing priorities in your life it's one thing to say to your kids yeah we follow Jesus follow Jesus but then all of a sudden it's like well your school work's really important so you don't have to go to kids club or to youth group this week or we won't go to church because of you know we want to spend time at our holiday house whatever it's going to be you know often faith is um, caught more than taught and uh, and kids have a very good hypocrisy meter and so it doesn't matter what you say, if in your actual deeds and priorities, it, it doesn't show that you really believe it, they'll pick up on that within a heartbeat. So I think that authenticity, believing in yourself, authenticity in your faith, and not trying to pretend to be something you're not. I think um, one of the terrible things in our world at the moment, maybe it's amplified by social media, or maybe it's this whole idea that we feel like we're evolving is that it, feels, it seems as though politicians and everyone are trying to present this face of being infallible. And what I love most of all is to hear a parent, to hear a politician, to hear someone in leadership say, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Let's, can you forgive me? Let's make a way forward. Oh, I, 
I'm astounded every time I hear it. It's such a simple thing, but it's it's the best thing you can say to your kids is just to admit fault when you are and uh, say you're sorry and let's move forward because that, that's the practice of grace, yep. um, which is what the gospel is about. Uh, Ruth, I don't know if you've got some Thank you, Mike. other advice. I thought that was a great answer, Mike. I, I, <laughs> one, one thing that I was thinking of it, to add to that, just in, in terms of critiquing culture, that uh, if you can sort of watch TV with them, watch their shows, engage with them with what's shaping their mind and their heart and help them to critique that through the gospel. Um, the, the, our first year class that I mentioned when they were talking about the Australian soul, they mentioned the show Bluey. And, you know, I haven't, I've only watched a few episodes, but it seems like Australian young people entranced by Bluey be really helpful to understand why uh, this vision, I guess, of a particularly a father that's very involved with his children and plays with them and it's full of joy and life and goodness. Um, it'd be great to talk with your kid about, you know, in what ways is being a Christian um, and understanding what Jesus has done for us, um, in what ways is, um, you know, Bluey's father like our heavenly father? for example, or, you know, what, just to make some links between what they're learning about their world and, uh, and the gospel. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Mike. We have been so blessed to have both of you share some of the issues because I know, look, I've, I've become a grandfather for the first time and uh, under COVID and, and I'm now going back to my how to be a good grandparent days now. So thank you for all the advice you've given me. Um, I really appreciate it. We have run out of time. David, could I ask you to close in prayer for me and then, um, and then we'll move on. Thank you. Yes, indeed. I love that line um, that the faith is more caught than taught. And I think there's a tremendous wisdom there. And so let's pray for parents now that they will help their young people to catch the faith. So, Father, we thank you for tonight's session and for the stimulating discussions that we've had. We do pray for parents who are out there youth pastors and school teachers in Christian schools and elsewhere, that they will live out the faith and that as they rub shoulders, brush shoulders with the young people that they are raising and encouraging, that indeed the faith would be caught and then people would come to that, that wonderful recognition of the value of the gospel. So we pray for parents, grandparents, youth pastors, school teachers. We also pray for lawmakers as they shape and, uh, and make the culture that they will have the wisdom of Christ that they so greatly need. So thank you, Lord, for this opportunity tonight. And uh, we pray that what we've learned, we will be able to put practically into action in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Once again, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Ruth. This webinar will be in our YouTube uh, channel in about a, at, by the end of the week or hopefully earlier. Um, on behalf of our governing board, our supporters Australia-wide, Ruth and Mike, thank you very much and God bless and good night to you all.